Well, it was recently Data Privacy Day, and news broke from the EFF that they reverse engineered the Ring doorbell app, the mobile app. They found that it sends data to Facebook and a whole bunch of other people, a lot of third-party affiliates. Oh, we accidentally included integration to send all kinds of personally identifiable information to all these third-party people. You don't even need the Ring doorbell. I did a video on setting up your own home surveillance system with Synology. Two cameras, completely free. You can add more cameras. There's a there's a license thing, but you're you know just a, a black box with some 10 terabyte hard drives. You can back up your computer. You can back up all of your stuff right there. It's not in the cloud. There's nobody that's going to be trawling your data, looking through your Dropbox, trying to build your shopping profile. This video was brought to you by Synology. They sponsored this video, but we're going to talk about some stuff that you can do to protect yourself online. And Synology also has online backup, their online C2 backup. Now, it uses AES-256 encryption. Uh, there's a file browser so that you can go online and log in and browse for the, the file that you need to restore. But when you enable client-side encryption, it encrypts it before it ever sends it to Synology. So it's very important that you keep track of your hopefully complicated password. The rates for online backup are very reasonable. I mean, we look at the website here. I mean, you know, a terabyte of information. Do you really have a terabyte that you need to back up? I mean, like home photos and movies and crap like that. But do you really need to back up, you know, Star Trek 17 times? Three, two, one backup rule. Three copies of your data on two different mediums with one on uh, with one off site. Three, two, one. One twenty eight was Data Privacy Day, and. I want you to take your data privacy seriously. I'm not sure what I'm gonna have to do to convince you. I mean, you might already be convinced, but even if you're aware of like how bad it is, it's pretty bad. Even small app vendors for your mobile phone or whatever that you might download, they can't wait to sell your data. So it's no surprise, like the Ring headline that I mentioned where it's like, oh, look at this. It's got data trackers from literally everybody who's gonna mine your data. I mean, that's... That's what, that's what I've been saying. But what can you do about it? How extensive is this? Well, the first thing I'm going to request you do is request your data. I'm requesting you to make a request. See see how that works? I think that uh, it's not really much of a problem in Europe with GDPR. In California, California just passed the Consumer Protection Act. So a lot of U.S. companies that do business in California, because pretty much every U.S. company does, are taking steps to be able to comply with the CCPA. So under the CCPA, uh, I think that's right. Or, yeah, uh, the California the California Act that went into effect January first, twenty twenty. You can request your data. You can request that a company not sell your data. Like you can maintain a relationship with them. You don't. You're not necessarily ending a relationship. So it's in some regards not as heavy handed as GDPR. But I think if you request your data and you need a little bit motivation, you know, to see what, what's going on with the cloud. Uh, you could get your data and see just how deep the rabbit hole goes. Now, it might very well be that you're of the position that, okay, I trust Google. I'm not going to put anything, you know, super personal or whatever in Google, but I'm, I'm okay with my location being tracked and I'm okay with, you know, other things that go on my advertising profile. That's fine. That's totally okay. But there are alternatives when you're sort of up against a wall. Like, I would not put you know, my tax and banking information online. And I was like, I'm just going to upload all this stuff to G drive where, you know, all of my other, I'm just going to make a folder for it and be super organized. No, that's crazy. What are you, are you insane? Dropbox or, or any of that? I mean, so there's, there's, it's a, it's a gradient. It's not, it's not black and white. And I can give you the tools that you need to sort of build and DIY your own experience because the promise of the cloud is convenience but technology has come so far that you don't need the cloud uh for the same level of convenience at least you don't need the the cloud where your data is also going to be data mined as a result of your use of a particular app uh, or a particular company's tools or a particular platform or whatever it happens to be and it really is kind of nuts that this is a a legal solution and not a technological solution because the technological solution is kind of there but uh, companies are sort of playing it fast and loose with your data and it seems like we're on a track to make your personal data about as toxic as asbestos I mean asbestos is, is great it's a naturally occurring material it's an incredible insulator you can make a lot of cool stuff with it you can you know you can get to the moon with it um, the cancer thing 
not so good. So I'm hoping that your personal data sort of becomes like the modern asbestos because of all the fines and stuff that are associated with mishandling your personal data. I mean, if you look at all of the GDPR fines issued to date, because GDPR hasn't been around so far, it's well over a billion dollars. It's, uh, it's a lot of money. And that is a huge liability for a lot of companies. So I'm hoping that with these laws that uh, we get a little bit more um, careful handling of personal data because you know every week there's a leak and your passwords are gone and, and all this kind of stuff. So my first piece of advice for you in protecting your online personal data is to try not to put it online or at least not to put it online in a willy-nilly kind of way. Uh, uploading documents that are not encrypted to cloud storage solutions is basically almost as bad as just publishing it on the open internet. And yeah, I mean, a public search engine can't find it, but if there's a security issue with Dropbox or there's a security issue with G Drive or there's a security issue with your, your personal account, then all of that is out there in the open for everybody to see. They can sort of see your your, your dirty laundry. They can sort of see uh, things that you, you may not want anybody else to know. And absolutely companies are mining this. We, we've sort of found out on the Level 1 News over the years that, you know, like there's this sort of cozy relationship between the advertising industry and Google and Visa. And when you make purchases and you get the email receipts, you know, Gmail is going to helpfully try to organize that. But if you don't think that data is also being mined, you are very, very naive. You're more naive than I am. So if you can, uh, don't get your... Don't put your data online. You can use different email addresses for different things. You can host your own email. That's actually pretty trivial. You can use other, there are other email services other than Gmail that are privacy respecting. If you decide to self-host, it does come with a little bit more responsibility. Like you have to be responsible for managing your data. You have to be responsible for security. You have to be responsible for backups, but we'll get to that in just, in, in just a minute. The other thing with making sure that your data is not online is use private browsing mode. Private browsing mode or incognito mode, uh, you know, don't use Chrome for anything that's that's privacy sensitive. Uh, Chrome incognito mode is, is maybe okay, but don't just use one browser. There's also Brave, which is a very good privacy respecting browser. Firefox, which is privacy respecting. And there are also extensions for Firefox like Ad Nauseam and I think Track Me Not. What these plugins do is not only sort of mess with the tracking cookies that all the different websites use, is they will actually create false histories. So there's just a thing running in the background, clicking on stuff, clicking around the web page, doing things. And so if any kind of profile that is being built on you, it just is filling it with crap because there are advertising profiles being built on you, if nothing else, by your IP address. Uh, you know, Verizon insert, inserted the uh, permanent cookie in any unencrypted traffic. Uh, so that they could fingerprint you. ISPs are messing with unencrypted DNS traffic, if you don't believe me, and you have YouTube or Netflix stuttering problems, use an encrypted DNS provider or use a VPN connection. And if you don't, it's like, oh, we don't we don't mind that for privacy. It's like, okay, well, you're monetizing it, so. You can also go full hazmat suit in terms of protecting your privacy online and use Tor and Tails. Now, I wouldn't personally recommend that you use those 24-7. I mean, you can. But uh, Tails is great because you can boot off of a USB and do something on the internet. And it's still going to come from your internet connection, but it's going to be connected through the Onion router. So maybe, uh, you know, if you wanted to post on the internet about how your company is dump dumping toxic sludge into the river, Tor might not be a bad choice. Tor from a coffee shop might not be a terrible choice. Tor from a coffee shop on a business trip might not be a terrible choice. Now, one of the first things that you have to do in you know the DIY cloud in protecting your privacy online because protecting your privacy online means storing your data yourself and sort of taking control and that means you're gonna have to have discipline you can't just sort of let Google sort of hold your hand and say oh yes look at these products and I can recommend this and let's figure this out and you have to sort of say no I'm going to do this and the first step that you can do for that is to organize your life now books Books are a huge part of the human condition. Books are, are a huge thing for me. And not just having books and being able to read books, but also making notes and annotations and, you know, augmenting whatever's in the wetware up here with uh, some kind of record, some kind of communication. I mean, there are books that I've, that I've read when I was a teenager, and I find notes or annotations or something that I made in the book, and I find that incredibly helpful. Uh, you know, to sort of go back and refresh my memory and look at those kinds of things. 
And the cloud is the promise of having immediate access to all those kinds of things. You know, historically, you might have to root around in a box at your house or it's like, oh, I wish I could find that book. I loaned it to somebody and it, it's got my annotations in it and I'll never get it back. And, you know, because that's the thing that happens because it takes people a long time and then you forget who you loaned a book to or or a display port repeater or whatever. And, uh, and then it's like, oh, it's a big deal to try to get it back. So, um... <laughs> Uh, you can put all of that in the cloud and then you're good to go uh, because you're managing it yourself. You know, Jeff Bezos changing the the book format means that, well, you get the book, but you lose your annotations or you lose your bookmarks. Or you go from reading the book on your phone to reading the book on your computer and where you stopped reading is that synchronized between devices. I mean, people, when YouTube added the, added the ability to keep track of the point that you watched in a video like I've watched the first 10 minutes of a video and then on my phone I can pick it up and watch you know the next 10 minutes or whatever people were like wow that is an amazing feature but Google is also tracking that so you can do that yourself but it's not as much fun on the YouTube platform but you can do that yourself with your own media and books and stuff like that but you got to sort of take control of it you got to organize it you can build a personal wiki a personal database that you that you put all of your files in and so you start to build this asset that's really valuable and enter backups. So Synology sponsored this video and having a place to store it, something like a Synology works really well. I mean, on this channel, we like to DIY things. I have a DIY home server, but I've been using the DS1618 plus for about four months or six months, something like that. And I get it. It's attractive. It's a small black box. You can put a ton of hard drives in it. It just sort of works silently. It works well. It runs Linux, so you can you can add stuff to it. There's plugins. We looked at Active Backup and the surveillance system before because the DIY surveillance system is a million. It's it is infinity percent better than Ring. Did you see the Ring headlines? I've mentioned it three times now. Did you see the Ring headlines? Super scary. But you just DIY it. Why wouldn't you want to DIY it? But then it becomes critically important to back all this up. So Synology offers their C2 backup. You know, check out the pricing for that. It's pretty good. In general, with backups, you should follow the 3 2, one rule. Three copies of your data in at least two different formats with one of those being off-site. Um, and C2 sort of gives you those things because you can back up your entire Synology to the cloud or you can just back up. Like, I've got... Uh, movies and, and media archived to an external hard drive and that doesn't really change much so I don't have a, a backup set up to just continually replicate that the only backups that I have that are continually replicated are files that I'm generating on a, on a daily basis like new documents for projects that I'm working on new pictures that I'm for projects that I'm working on that kind of thing and you can set all of that up on your Synology you can set up uh, you know, your individual workstations, you know, I've got a laptop and a desktop computer, those can all back up to that, and then that can back up off-site. You don't have to use Synology service, you can use Amazon Glacier, which is kind of cheap until you actually have to restore something, and then it's sort of cumbersome and expensive. That's another thing that's really cool about the C2 backup from Synology, is that it's got a file browser. And so you can just browse and restore a particular file from a particular point in time, because depending on the service plan that you get, you can maintain, you know, 10 snapshots going back in time for what you're looking for. So you can have a couple of daily backups and a weekly backup, whatever retention and rotation schedule that you want to set up. It's pretty cool stuff because that's more enterprise level, but it's accessible and it's point and click. Also the encryption. So AES-256. How good is AES-256? AES-256, at least the algorithm, is very good. And it is probably uh, not going to be broken anytime soon. And it's not really vulnerable to advances in, in quantum computing. Uh, Bruce Schneier in Applied Cryptography talks about a lot of really interesting things with cryptography. If you're into cryptography, you should buy the book. But there's a passage specifically on AES-256. And I will read part of that for you now so that you understand how secure AES-256 is. Because this is one of my favorite passages in a book. One of the consequences of the second law of thermodynamics is that a certain amount of energy is necessary to represent information. To record a single bit by changing the state of a system requires an amount of energy no less than KT, where T is the absolute temperature of the system and K is the Boltzmann constant. Okay, that's the minimum amount of energy, the physical laws of the universe. So let's talk about the energy output of the sun in relation to the minimum amount of energy required to flip a bit in a counter. Not necessarily do useful computation. We're just talking about the minimum amount of energy to go from 
you know, all zeros to zero and a one. So the annual energy output of the sun would be enough to power about 2.7 times 10 to the 56 single bit changes on an ideal computer. So if we built a Dyson sphere around the sun and captured all of the energy output of the sun for 32 years with no loss whatsoever, we could power a computer to count to two to the 192 power. And remember, it's a 256 bit AES key. So what about a supernova? A supernova puts out more energy, right? Yeah, so a supernova releases enough energy, uh, you know, just, Imagine that we could harness all of the energy output of a supernova and channel that into an orgy of computation, as Bruce Schneier says. That would be enough energy to cycle a 219-bit counter. So Bruce Schneier concludes that uh, these numbers have nothing to do with the technology of the devices. They are the maximums that thermodynamics will allow, and they strongly imply that brute force attacks against 256-bit AES keys will be infeasible until computers are built from something other than matter and occupy something other than space. So AES-256, the algorithm, pretty good. AES-256, uh, the implementation is not necessarily guaranteed to be good. So what do I mean by that? Well, if there's a bug in the implementation of AES-256 and the implementation of the algorithm, the, impl the computer program that implements the algorithm, your effective key space that you have to search may not be 256 bits big. So because the AES-256 encryption runs client side, Synology is not gonna be mining your data or doing anything with it. I mean, think about, Think about it on a long time scale, being able to create for yourself a time capsule that, you know, 10 years from now, it's like, here's my playlist of music that I was listening to along with the music. And here's what I was thinking. And here's, you know, pictures from my phone sorted by date and time. Uh, you could use third party synchronization software that's also encrypted, like SyncThing. SyncThing, I mean, there's, there's a ton of different synchronization software and I want to show some different setups but you can really do some amazing things. You could set up something on Linode, like Nextcloud, our de-googling yourself series. We're gonna refresh that soon. Uh, and then it could have a very small instance on Linode, so you're not paying a ton of money for terabytes and terabytes of storage in the cloud, but the Linode can be a gateway back through your home internet connection to your Synology. So for things like music streaming and you know book synchronization, bookmark synchronization, annotation synchronization even a terrible home internet connection will be plenty fast enough plenty fast enough for email even uh, media streaming is maybe doable but you need a media server there's plex media server which has a subscription it's not terrible but again the whole data mining thing or not i don't know because there's titles and it does metadata but you can also use other open source things like mb so there are a ton of options there i mean the universe if there's a whole universe of options for protecting your data privacy. And it's a fun hobby, like getting into this and sort of DIYing this, you can end up with a better setup that is more tailored to what you need than you can get with a cloud document storage thing that's gonna change on a whim. It's like, you know, the service could change. Uh, books could disappear. I think, you know, Jeff Bezos lost the rights to 1984, so that just disappeared off of people's Kindles. Uh, it just. That was a thing. I don't know if it's 1984. Some book disappeared. So it's like, not only did you lose the book, but you also lost the other stuff. Microsoft had their online book thing. They're like, you know what? This isn't really working for us. We're going to turn it off. If you had the files on your device and you build out the convenience of the cloud, why wouldn't you do that? And you get automatic data privacy built in from doing that. It's not hard. It just takes a little discipline. And yes, yes, the irony of posting this on YouTube is not lost on me. But uh, it's a little bit like Vader, where he says, you know, pray we don't alter the deal any farther. But our community is a pretty strong one. We've got our own community forums that, that we run, and also Floatplane and Patreon, where our community supports us. And so I think that our communities are a lot stronger on those platforms than YouTube. So thank you. Thank you all for the support, and I'll see you in the next one.